so it's my honor to be here this evening. Uh, I, I have glasses, but they're from TJ Maxx. <laughs> Three no, pair for $9.99, so, you know, because they're cute and they're cult, sometimes colorful. And uh, I know that Pat sent me some wonderful questions, which I can see if I stand right here, but when I sit over there, I don't see anything. Um, so I'm going to call up our wonderful panelists this evening, uh, the, in, the incredibly talented Gerald Griffin. Please join us. And the wonderful Michelle Duster, please, Michelle, come up and join us. And my dear friend Ernie Wong, and you know, I, I, I told him like if we start talking too much about Kim Wood High School, that y'all should stop us because that's how long I've known this man. Right? So we're, we're in for a treat this evening, and what more timely discussion um, than this can we be having here in the city of Chicago, the city of Big Shoulders, this, the, 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 the herbs and hortos sit in a garden uh, with our wonderful parks and memorials in a lot of these parks, right? Uh, and in this global discussion, as Pat mentioned, this is a global discussion. Uh, a, a racial reckoning globally, uh, an equity reckoning globally, uh, a time when we're told we can't think critically because it might hurt someone's feelings, um, and yet uh, standing up for monuments that were erected not for celebration of individuals, but really in my personal opinion, as an act of terrorism. Um, so we have a lot to talk about this evening. Uh, rather than me telling you who all these magnificent people are, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So we'll start with uh, with Michelle. And then we'll reach out the way. Hello. I'm Michelle Duster. I'm a uh, writer, professor, public historian. And I happen to be a great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. Um, I've been involved for the past, I've, I've actually uh, put together a little list for myself, and I realized today that I've been involved in uh, public history projects for 15 years now, and there were a few before that, so it's been a little while um, since I've been involved in um, creating work that contributes to and honors and celebrates the contributions specifically of African Americans and so, uh, my name is Gerald Griffin. Uh, I am a artist and uh, I'm a painter, sculptor, and writer here in Chicago. Uh, I have an uh, art gallery and uh, interior design business, me and my wife, uh, so for the Design Center. Um, I've been creating works of art all my life, but professionally about 30 years or so. Um, this new body of work actually grew out of uh, the subject that we're here to discuss, this, this idea of monuments and, um, and how they affect society and what they mean to us. And I was in the middle of a, uh, or I should say just finishing up a series called Ambiguous Reflections of Race and Identity, A Question of Color. I had a solo show at a museum in Lafayette, Indiana. And within that series, I incorporated um, two-dimensional and three-dimensional work. So I started to kind of explore these ideas through sculpture. And just so happens that uh, in the summer of uh, 2020, we had uh, this eruption of emotion and, um, and energy. And as a extension of the work I was already doing, the idea for um, the creation of a counter-narrative to the narrative that we've been given through monuments and histories in the past, this idea came to me. And that's how these, these uh, pieces came to be. So I'll talk a little more in depth about those as we go along. It's a pleasure to be here with all of these esteemed panelists and my dear friend, Perry Irmer, um, who, quite frankly, I wouldn't be here if it had not been for her mother. Um, who at Kenwood High School 
and it was a high school at that time, uh, got me out of the trouble I was in and, 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 and made me become a landscape architect, quite frankly. Uh, that was the trajectory. Um, I'm a landscape architect. I'm, I'm here in Chicago. Uh, I've been, uh, had a practice here for 31 years. Doing public space, and public space is really important to all of us. And, and I think since this pandemic has uh, gained even more importance uh, on, on who we are, discovering who we are, uh, understanding uh, ourselves within this greater world, and uh, what we need to do to continue to live our lives. And so that's really important. Um, but I wear a lot of different hats. I, I, um, one of the other hats I, I have is uh, I'm the chair of the, uh, the Chicago Landmarks Commission, uh, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Um, in 2007, I was, I was appointed uh, to replace uh, a young woman named Michelle Obama. And um, she, uh, when I first met her, I introduced myself. I'm Ernie Wong, you know, I, I took your place on the, on the Landmarks Commission. She said, oh, well, it's so nice to meet you. She says, how's everybody doing? And I said, this is great. And she says, how are you doing with it? I said, you know, it's crazy. They send you this stack about a week before the commission meeting, and you've got to read it. I feel like I'm lost in this stuff. And she says, oh, she says, I understand. Want to trade places? <laughs> and at that point, I realized, you know what, uh, it's all in perspective, right? It's all, it's all how you take it. Um, but the other hat that I wear is I, I do sit on the uh, committee, uh, the DK's committee on, on uh, Chicago Monuments. And it has been an eye-opening experience for the last uh, you know, 14 months, I guess it is, uh, since I've joined that committee and discussing our monuments here in Chicago. So here you go. Thank you, Ernie and Cheryl and, uh, and Michelle. Um, so this idea of placemaking, right? Um, that purpose of place, that strength of place, that, that right to be in a place, right? And whether that place celebrates you and your culture, your community, or someone else's narrative, right? Uh, and that's really, I think, at the root of a lot of the discussions and a lot of the debates that have been uh, had of late around monuments, around memorials. Um, so Ernie, it's interesting, and as your job is, your art is public spaces, um, what would you say is the most important uh, consideration as you are designing a public space and the art and recognition that goes into that public space as you move from community to community? That's a great question, Billy. Uh, one, one of the things that we always talk about um, whenever we're starting to design a public space is uh, who, who, what is the identity of who we, we are uh, designing for? And, and, you know, when you look at Chicago, which is a very segregated, it, it's a neighbor, you know, we have neighborhoods of every different culture, but we're all very segregated in, in a lot of ways. And, and it changes. I mean, you look at Andersonville, which is what, two schools businesses right now? The Green Town, which uh, announced a couple months ago that Green Town is going to close, which therefore, you know, Green Town is not going to go, no longer be there. And you look at these communities that continue to evolve, um, but it's the identity of who you are at that time, which is really important to recognize that history. And I think that's really important. Those are the questions we ask whenever we're designing uh, public spaces. Uh, who is the community that we're designing for? I don't know what to do. And I know that, uh, Gerald, you have looked not only this beautiful um, sculpture of Kamala Harris, um, but as you look around the city and understanding the way time moves and, and the shifting uh, awareness in various communities of who our heroes are. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge? I mean, we've got plenty of space, but how do we, again, back to spaces, how do we claim that space for the stories that we, especially as black people, uh, want to tell to recapture uh, the control of that narrative in terms of what we want to memorialize? 
Well, uh, in my experience with um, the monuments that the various monuments that I've seen around the city, public art uh, in the main square as well as in uh, various neighborhoods, um, and as a collective of people, African Americans, I think that we've become accustomed to the fact that our story is not told. Uh, it isn't just in art, but in just about every field of human endeavor. Our histories are not told, our stories are not told. We're left out of uh, the conversation and so many different things. I think I, I talked about an analogy of a Band-Aid that is supposed to camouflage your wound. And most Band-Aids are pink. So, and nothing against pink people, but I'm not pink. So I'm left out of that conversation. I'm left out of that thought. And I think as a collective of people, we grow up and we ingest and get used to this kind of people. And it takes a cataclysmic event to kind of shake us and wake us up. And I think that's what happened with uh, the death of George Floyd. And that awakening made people be aware of their surroundings and their environment all of a sudden. And the lack of our stories and narratives within that environment. And I think the, the, uh, the primal emotion was we need to rip this down, we need to tear it down. And as an artist, my um, first thought was, you know, what would be a creative social response to this situation? And I thought it created an opportunity for us to address this idea and address this void of our stories within the public narrative. So my first, um, my first instinct was to write all of this down before it goes away, and then make a proposal and send it out to, you know, in my excitement, send it out to all these people, send it to the mayor, send it to this uh, senator. And after not hearing back from anyone <laughs> for about a month, I said, well, maybe it's, it's difficult for people to envision what I have in mind. So I started these maquettes. I started one of Kamala Harris, because she represents the contemporary history. I started the one with Barack Obama, because he, in turn, represents a contemporary history, um, which is very reflective of our, our historical history, where after the Emancipation Proclamation, when African Americans uh, experienced a certain degree of freedom, uh, there was a backlash. There was an extreme backlash. And many of these monuments came to be. Uh, the Confederate monuments, the romanticized, hurtful monuments. Um, glorifying uh, a past that was steep in slavery. And Barack Obama's uh, story of being the first African American president, then being followed by a president and a movement and an attack on the Capitol is almost that same dynamic, but brought into a contemporary time. So I think art gives us a opportunity to have those narratives and have those discussions about ourselves, our past, our future. So these pieces that I'm creating, I brought two uh, posters to show works that are in progress. Uh, Frederick Douglass' piece is a young Frederick Douglass, because those kids out there in Black Lives Matter were young. Martin Luther King was in his 30s. Malcolm X, these, these people were young. And they were making a difference in the world. And having these monuments in the public square speaks to this young generation and says that your actions can also make a difference in the world. That kind of um, interaction, that kind of um, self-reflection is something that has historically been missing and it is missing to a great degree as we speak. Um, and there are some efforts to, you know, murals and monuments within certain neighborhoods. It's kind of the mindset. And I have a different idea because um, because of the idea that Chicago is so segregated. Um, how do we address that segregation? Why don't we create some of those monuments and put them in the main public square? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And you know, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, every time I go to Washington, uh, and visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, without fail, I'm going up that escalator and I'm seeing that Washington Monument and I, I, I cry every time because it's this permanence now, right? Um, that 
finally we're in the place we're entitled to be and where we should have been all this time. And the idea of the permanence of the material itself, right? The permanence of bronze, of stone, of steel, and, and marble, right? That, that, that elemental material that is permanent, that means something. There's a, there's a heaviness, a permanence, a del deliberateness about creating a monument, right? Whether that is a building, uh, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's representational or abstract, um, there's something about the permanence of that, um, that that makes all the difference, right? So you can paint a mural, but the elements are going to get to a mural, right? You can, you know, you can have an exhibit, but an exhibit comes to an end. Um, and I think sometimes that the whole idea of the creation of these monuments was to plant a flag, right, of the Confederacy, to plant a flag of our version or their version of history and say, damn it, this is here to stay, right? And so as society changes, as the truth comes out, as we are made to confront these issues, um, it's the very permanence of the monuments that are being removed that I think is the most, um, felt the most viscerally about those objecting to it. And yet it's also felt the most viscerally by us who have, we who have longed for that for so long, um, that recognition and that permanence. Um, so Michelle, I want to ask you, of course, you know, everyone here, I'm sure, I hope, knows the story of Ida B. Wells, and that was your great grandmother. And she, we have a, we have, you know, the flag hanging in, um, in the DuSable Museum of African American History. Uh, a man was lynched today. And she wouldn't let us forget about this. She was burned out of her office, her newspaper office down south, and came to Chicago where she could more freely do this work, this very important work. And as we dedicated Congress Boulevard in, in Ida B. Wells' name, and you were faced with how do we memorialize this woman, right? Can you tell us a little bit about how you thought about Richard Hunt, how you thought about making that a representational piece as opposed as, I mean, an abstract piece about the philosophy as opposed to a representational piece of she as a woman, as her individual visage. Um, tell, talk a little bit about that and, and how you came to that decision. What was your thought process? Well, uh, so I was a member of a committee um, that I was invited to join in 2008 as a result of a letter that I wrote to Richard M. Daly at the time because there was a, um, a significant housing community named the Ida B. Balls Homes which stood on the south side in Bronzeville for over 60 years and it started to be dismantled in 2002 as a result of the plan for transformation for mixed income housing. And so I, my entire life, the Ida B. Wells homes existed. And um, so to me, it was just kind of normal, you know, to have this, this uh, tribute to my great grandmother. And as they started to become um, dismantled, my uh, several family members and I were talking about, well, wait a minute. Okay, the housing community that was named after Ida B. Wells is being dismantled, but she herself was not a building. She herself was not a community of, of building. She was a woman. And she herself, as a woman, still needs to be recognized by the city of Chicago for what she contributed to this country. So I wrote a letter to uh, Mayor Daly at the urging of my father who and my uncle were like, you write it. And I'm like, oh my God. So, um, so I wrote this letter saying, what you gonna do about recognizing Ida as a woman because she was not a building. Um, so since the city decided to, to tear down the building, I felt the city needed to come up with a plan. Um, so anyway, I was uh, uh, asked to join a committee that already existed, which uh, was formed at the 
initiative of the former um, residents of the housing community. So to me, this is about community involvement also. Um, it wasn't a family-driven um, initiative. It was a community-driven um, um, issue. And so that, to me, meant a lot because she, she, mean, she meant a lot to the people who lived in Bronzeville. And um, so once I joined this committee, we were all sitting around trying to decide what would make sense. And we looked at a lot of different options. There were a lot of different options that we considered. And we finally decided that a monument would make sense because uh, Ida B. Wells was a very multi-dimensional, very complex uh, person. She was involved in so many different things. I mean, she was a journalist, she was a suffragist, she was a civil rights activist, she was a social worker, she was a sociologist, um, and, um, and she was involved in you know, housing. She had the Negro Fellowship League. There were so many aspects to her. And we wanted to create something, or have something created, because we didn't create it. Uh, we, <laughs> Richard Hunt was the person that we um, felt would be the best person to create an abstract, interpretive piece that people, when they enter or experience the work, would bring themselves into it and be able to interpret her in whatever they're bringing to that space. Um, and so we felt that would be a better way to, for us to represent her versus w us deciding for the visitor what they would experience. We wanted people to experience what had meaning to them. And we left it up to Richard Hunt to figure out how to do that. Um, so he's the one who came up with the ideas of having three pillars um, that represented her journalism, suffrage movement, and the civil rights activism. And he's the one that came up with the idea to have the plaques um, in, in, embedded into the um, spaces. So, so it was an innovative way to have imagery of her without it being a statue. Um, and we also chose uh, quotes of hers that would make her own voice be heard. Um, that represented those different areas of her life, um, and, and you know, also with a short biographical information. So that was our way of helping people sort of experience for themselves what they take out of it of, of her story. So we've seen a lot of um, reaction to uh, the addition of monuments and memorials that are that have been erected uh, to commemorate events or historical figures, right? Uh, the Emmett Till Memorial, for instance, in Money, Mississippi, which is uh, set on the banks of the of the of the river uh, that he was drowned in, uh, or thrown in after he was brutally murdered, regularly is defaced, right? Regularly is shot, uh, shot at with you know bullet holes you see every single year. Um, so now it's my understanding that they're making it out of a, like almost like a Kevlar type material uh, that can't uh, that can't be pierced with uh, you know the, the, the regular old bullets from the shotgun on the gun rack on the back of the pickup down there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, and, 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 and most recently, the George Floyd Memorial uh, in New York was splattered with paint. But curiously, the John Lewis bust near it and uh, the other bust near it were, were not. It was just, I think, the, something about the truth, right? Something about representing in, in a physical mode what was really done so recently. Um, so how do we, how do we, how do we not necessarily protect against that? Uh, because I'm a firm believer that the passage of time, hopefully, if we're still here, if we haven't fallen into um, a fascist regime, um, that time will fix some of that. But how do you, like right through here, what do you suggest, you know, Ernie and, and, and Gerald and, uh, and Michelle, to have that dialogue that can counter this 
a sort of knee-jerk, visceral reaction of hatred. And I guess it's just how do you counter racism, but what do you do to make that message come across that these are representations of things that are so important and because they're made out of steel and stone and bronze, deal with it? I'm going to start with this. Um, you know, because I'm old enough to remember the 1968 riots, right? And what happened, and, and, and what that happened happened to all the cities across America during the civil rights movement. And I'm also old enough to remember 24, 24 years later, Rodney King. Mm -hmm. And then last year, 26 later after Rodney King, is George Floyd. So we're talking about the same damn thing. 50 years later, and we're hoping that this time around it starts to evolve. I just told you, you know, when we're sitting here having dinner, this wonderful meal, thank you, um, about having to get into people's minds. And, but you can't tell anybody over 20 years old after they've already established what their values are and what they're thinking. It's so hard to change them after 20 years old. So we got to get them young. Yes. And it's the education, and it is the storytelling, and it is uh, just, you know, putting that out there. This is the truth. And, and, and the hatred is just, it's got to go away. I mean, we're, we're, we're living in a world right now where the internet is just like, it's bleeding, it's bleeding us all out. And, and, and how do you start to take that away? I don't know, so maybe somebody else has to answer that. Um, I think I have a different perspective on it. Um, I think that uh, the one way to address a lie is the truth. So there's this lie that's been pervasive since the beginning of this country about white supremacy. And when those telling that lie are confronted with the truth, they have a knee-jerk reaction to want to destroy that truth so that the lie can live. So beyond monuments and art, you had a mob of people who tried to destroy the Capitol building to preserve a lie, who tried to uh, rip down the American flag and post up a Confederate flag or a Nazi flag, who uh, did all kind of you know vile things and spread vile things all through the hallways, on the walls and floors. And you said, well, what would motivate people to have such a you know strong reaction? And it's this idea that the lie is going to be uncovered. So this is a lie that's been told for generations by parents to their children. And when the truth comes out, it makes their children say, mom, dad, you lied to me. So that's a strong reaction. People don't want their kids to know that they stole all these things. Uh, when you go in most mu museums, those are stolen objects you're looking at, that they uh, robbed and killed and murdered and pillaged and committed some of the worst atrocities that you can imagine. They want their kids to look up to them, and they want to be the hero. So you're combating uh, with this truth uh, centuries of a lie that's had an opportunity to build itself up and up and up. So the monuments that exist help to reinforce that lie. Instead of tearing down those monuments, I think they should stay up. And I think that we, as artists, and as people of conscience, should create a counter narrative. Because when we put the truth next to the lie, the lie falls apart. So most people are multidimensional and very complex. Thomas Jefferson was, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, the President of the United States, was also a slave owner who raped one of his slaves and had kids and kept his kids in slavery. So instead of tearing down the Thomas Jefferson monument, 
I would create a monument of Sally Hemings and her children and put them right next to Thomas Jefferson. And now the narrative about Thomas Jefferson takes on a different. No one can say, hey, you're doing something wrong to Thomas Jefferson. I'm just telling the truth. And the truth gets rid of that lie. So that's what my historical monument series was about. That's the idea behind it. Those historical truths and contemporary truths. So that's what these, I mentioned the Frederick Douglass piece. And back of him, he's holding a broken shackle and chains behind his back. And in front, he's holding his lapel. It's a young Frederick Douglass to speak to this young generation to say, this runaway slave who ran away, taught himself to read, eventually became an advisor to Lincoln and was uh, influential in the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. All of this he did from him, himself. What can you do? What is your capacity? Don't let anyone tell you that you cannot achieve whatever it is you do. We don't get those stories. We didn't, I didn't get the story of the Statue of Liberty being introduced to or being a gift to the United States because of the Emancipation Proclamation and France saying, you know, America's living up to its ideals. We want to give you this monument, a monument that was supposed to be a black woman with broken shackles. However, America didn't want that as the lasting image of America, so it became Persephone with the light of truth walking through darkness. The artist insisted that the shackle chains remain on the feet. So on this huge monument atop a two-story building, the Statue of Liberty has chains and shackles on her feet. When I learned this story, I was taken off. I was like, wow, I never knew the Statue of Liberty had something to do with black history. What is, that's another story where black people were involved. I have no idea. We didn't get taught, I didn't get taught that in school. So in, this, in my series, uh, Paradigm Shift, all of the sculptures, most of the paintings had this this motif, this iconic motif that kept showing up. You know, figures standing on an American flag with broken shackles and chains. Uh, a painting of you know, two people sitting together on top of an American flag with a broken chain in front of them to bring some attention to this idea when people talk about those paintings. Again, talking about the Statue of Liberty, talking about our history, and talking about those unknown narratives that help not only to shape the consciousness of black people, but the consciousness of all people. Yeah, yeah. 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 well right. said. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to, I want to pick up on that theme of yours, which is um, completeness of history, yes. right? Yes. And completeness of the narrative and the objectivity of the narrative, right? So there's a saying that, you know, the, the, to the, to the the, the victor becomes the narrator, right? And that can't be that can't be tolerated any longer because we really are the victors, right? Uh, and so it's the completeness of the story. And as a, the president of a history museum, right, um, I have a problem with the subtractive nature uh, of some of the positions um, uh, around. Uh, monuments and memorials. I would prefer, like you, to take an additive approach, right? right. Tell the whole story. Tell Bill Cosby's whole story. Come on. Tell uh, R. Kelly's whole story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Tell Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln's whole story, which is not to detract from the, uh, the great things that these men accomplished, right. but let's just have a complete story, a complete narrative that is a, 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 a historically objective one, right? Uh, and includes those chapters uh, that folks tried to take together the pages, so you couldn't turn that page. Uh, but now, because of technology, because of awareness, because uh, of uh, the public outcry, uh, we are able to get to those pages and tell those stories, and especially for our children and our grandchildren. Um, to understand the importance of the completeness of the story. Um, so keep Columbus, right? You know, but tell what really happened, <laughs> right? Keep Washington, but tell what really happened. Uh, and because we have access now to that technology, you can do that with a QR code, as well as additional monuments and memorials that are in the same space. Uh, Ernie and I were talking before 
um, before uh, we, we came up here at dinner about Washington Park, right? Don't move George, just add Harold. <laughs> Nobody has to change your address. No graphic artists have to be engaged. Google don't mind. Google can Google still. Google is still in the same place, but it's Harold, Washington Park, right? Um, and so this additive approach, I think, m m better serves our generations that are coming uh, because it is all about uncovering what was previously hidden, right? And technology really allows us to do that, and the children demand it, and they're the ones who are going to save our behinds, right? They're the ones who are going to save us, and they're the ones who have to know, right? So Michelle, I would, I, I'd like to know what you think your great grandmother would have to say right now as she is seeing these monuments, the the really egregious ones who uh, that were really erected in 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 the mind of terrorists to keep us in our place in the South. Um, what would she think of now, looking all around the country, but also in northern cities, places like Chicago? Uh, what would she think about this debate? What would she be saying uh, in response? It's always really difficult for me to guess what my great-grandmother would think, um, considering the fact that she grew up during a very different time. Um, she died 90 years ago. Um, I would say considering what she did during her lifetime and what she encountered during her lifetime, um, you know, more than likely she would not be surprised uh, by, by what we're uh, dealing with in this country because she actually went through a lot worse um, where people were literally dragged from their homes and, and burned alive and just all kinds of horrible things that were happening uh, during her time. I did want to uh, respond to what Gerald said as far as um, you know how we would approach things today. I agree that with the additive uh, approach because I don't think that tearing down, my fear um, with if we tear down everything that, that we right now feel is offensive, there could be a danger that there would be a denial that any of this ever happened. Right. Yeah. Um, and so then we would be faced with, well, no, it really did happen. You know, there really was slavery. It's like, well, no, it wasn't. But if we like, yeah, okay, there was slavery in this country, and these are the people who were um, slaveholders, and these were the people who um, were slave traders, and these were the uh, Confederate um, generals. In Memphis, my great-grandmother lived in Memphis for about 10 years of her life, and there were several statues to Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a Confederate general. He was one of the founders of the Klan, and he was a major uh, slaveholder, and he was the person who was the aggressor with Fort Pillow uh, massacre, if you're familiar with that. So, I mean, he did a lot of really horrible things, um, but the city of Memphis um, honored him in multiple ways. And I always felt that there should be a statue of Ida B. Wells right next to Nathan Bedford Forrest <laughs> at every single occasion, because it was more than one uh, statue of him. And I'm like, tell the story. I wanted her. To, I wanted there to be a statue of her facing him. <laughs> and and so when school kids are taking their little you know field trips, then they would have to talk about this person who was a slaveholder and the the founder of the Ku Klux Klan staring down. Or she will be staring down at him, the person who was against anti, you know, against lynching and was speaking out for justice and equality and democracy and um, in a full citizenship. And I thought that would be a better way to have a full dialogue about the realities of this country and the differing ideas of what this country is supposed to be and who it's supposed to be for, who is welcome and who is not welcome, who is considered a full citizen, who is not considered a full citizen, whose voices should be heard and whose voices should be silenced. And I felt like um, that I, I, that's just my personal opinion, that would be a better way to have a dialogue and have conversation and have thought which is something this country seems to be against. 
Um, you know, there seems to be this idea that everybody needs to be spoon-fed um, one narrative. Why can't there be multiple narratives and multiple realities and multiple perspectives? And I think that is what would really make this country what it could be. I totally agree. I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, when, when you hear about, you know, the Robert E. Lee statue was, was taken down in Richmond, Virginia, and, and, and you think about, well, why, do you, why, why couldn't you just add slaves at the base of that on the backs of slavery, you know, to tell that story? I actually do agree with that. You know, we, we're encountering on the, on the Monuments Committee in Chicago this situation of, uh, I believe it's 42 monuments that are problematic. And we have been, you know, D case has been reaching out to, throughout the city, to having discussions with everybody um, about this and trying to get more and more conversation going about these problematic uh, uh, monuments. Uh, Michelle Boone, former uh, commissioner, brought up in our last committee meeting, okay, now it's been 18 months, you know, what are you gonna do? You've identified them as problematic, so what are you gonna do? Are you, when is that recommendation gonna come out? And I, I, I you know, I didn't really know how to, how to answer this, but I did say, if you go to the airport and you go to a, uh, go to the bathroom, and one of the toilets are, there's a sign on the stall that says, I'm bored. And so, you know, in the meantime, until a recommendation is had, and I love your idea about the QR code, that put up a sign there, or put, you know, hang something on that, that problematic statue or problematic memorial mm -hmm. and say, out of order. Out of order. It's out of order. And this is where you can find out some more information, or you can add to that conversation, or you can do something. Yeah. But it gives notice, not only to everybody <laughs> around there, but also the community. This is problematic. Yeah. And then so, if it gets removed, or something else happens, it's not a surprise to anybody. It's mm -hmm. been problematic. Yeah. And that there's more to the story. Yeah. There's more, there's yet to be told. Right? Yeah. That's okay, I can't read it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is, uh, we're in a very unique time, right? Thank you, Ernie. We're in a very unique time, and we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, who, who and what merits representation on the public square, and who makes a decision about the public square, right? And at least in the past, you've only had a very small percentage of the public that makes a decision about the public square, right? Uh, and now, uh, as we are finding our voices and, and demanding to be heard, um, there should be, I think, some policy discussion about, you know, who gets to make that placement, right? Who makes that determination going forward? Because, you know, none of us here were asked in the past, do you want to see that? Yeah, so uh, I kind of talked about how right. this uh, body work evolved and how, you know, initially I sent out these proposals. And this was like the day after they were, you know, throwing paint on them statue talking about tearing it down and they are gonna have the National Guard out. And I didn't hear anything back. And later on there was a Chicago Monuments Committee that was created. And I was like, that's my proposal. Nobody invited me to the committee. How did this come about? I know I sent one to the mayor. Um, that idea about uh, making decisions on what goes into the public Square. What goes into which? What, what art? What artists? What voices are being heard? Mm -hmm. um, it's public, mm -hmm. yeah. and as members of the public, all citizens, mm -hmm. you know, we, we support those things. We create those things with our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. Everybody pays taxes. Even a homeless person is paying sales taxes. Mm -hmm. Everybody pays taxes. Everybody has a voice that should be heard. Their input should be made. It shouldn't be just a few select. Um, figures deciding what is and what isn't good for the masses of people to digest or ingest. 
In these pieces that I'm creating, I included a QR code. In the finished bronzes, there will be a QR code where you can scan this piece and it will take you to a video of me describing how this was made, what the narrative is about, and the entire story. Because that interaction and that conversation, for me, is more important than the art itself. So I think that's how we start to make changes because that's available to everybody and anybody. Other people are able to see these works, understand your perspective, like Michelle mentioned, perspective, and maybe hear and see a perspective that's different from their own, and they're able to change their idea about what is real and what isn't. Well, we're coming up on 8 o'clock, or shortly thereafter. Um, we promised a Q&A, so uh, let's move to a, a Q&A, and then we'll, you know, talk about a couple other things before we all head home. Anyone? Yes? So, um, Ernie, as a member of the committee, how do we get the right person in front of you that you can add to the committee, like a Gerald Griffin or a Michelle? How do we do that? And what support do we give to them to make that happen? There is, there is a chair of the committee. Um, Actually, right now I can't. Even, uh, it's Bonnie McDonald, if I recall correctly, who's the head of uh, preservation, Illinois, or Landmarks, Illinois. Um, but I think absolutely that that committee needs to expand, and it needs to uh, have more voices at the table. Um, so you know, that's my recommendation: is to write Miss McDonald and and. Um, you know, copy me. That's fine. <laughs> I'm trying to do what I can do. I'm an advocate for it. So. Okay. Any other questions for our panel? Yeah. Yes. Um, have they done a survey of all of the monuments in the city of Chicago? And if they have, how would you characterize our collection? They, they did a. Um, as much of a survey as they could do. Yeah, and, and I don't know all the details of it. That's how they got these 42 problematic uh, pieces um, to start with. And I know there's 300 and some, you know, three to 400 uh, pieces that have been surveyed. Uh, so, um, you know, is that continuing? I, I would hope so. Uh, but it is interesting. Those are only pieces that are within the public way also. Which is a little different. If you have a, if you have a sculpture, or you have a piece on private property. That's not going to get assessed. Um, so, uh, but that has been has happened. Uh, I would suggest going to DCase's website uh, on the Monuments Project, and you'll get all that information about what was identified. Yeah, question. Yes. I'm just curious. What does the landscape look like in the next six months? 12 months, 18 months, in terms of what's actually going to happen on the ground with these monuments in Chicago? I mean, is there something documented that we as citizens of Chicago can see and we understand what the budgets are, what's in the works, what's being contested? Is there a public record of any of that? Not yet. Um, that, that was a discussion about two weeks ago about what is the plan going forward. Yeah. And, 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 um, that being said, I believe there is a committee that is reviewing um, new pieces, uh, such as Ivy Wells, uh, you know, Richard Hunt's piece that went up, uh, that was vetted. Uh, and I, I don't know who vetted it, but it was vetted and, and it went forward. I, mean, I know the mayor has allocated a lot of money to culture and to using culture as a bridge in the city. And that's yeah. During her tenure. So is that a separate budget from the monuments budget? And is there synergy there? Is the, are, they, are they separated or are they together? It is. That's a bigger pot of money that I think the Monuments Project kind of grabs from if things come up. But then, you know, one of the things that you should take note is the city of Chicago is one thing. You see all these projects in Chicago parks 
Yeah. That's a whole different, you know, the Chicago Park District owns a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of stuff on their property, which is not necessarily city property. And so yeah. there's, yeah. it gets a little crazy. But I think the citizens of Chicago, that's the public square. So yeah. whatever is public, what's in a public space, is considered part of the community. So like differentiating monuments from urban art and public art, it's, it seems kind of silly to my It's an ecosystem of conversation. And it seems like the entity sh should be coordinating as much as the citizens, the, the way the citizens integrate the public art, the entity should be integrating those dialogues. Yeah, I, I would agree. And um, I want to ask a question, in terms of the composition of the Memorials Committee, um, you have, I'm assuming, architects and urban planners and artists, artists. Um, but do you also have history professors and scholars? There are, yeah, historians. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you have a question right over here. Wow. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, how are you doing? Um, my name is Dr. Wale, the Public South Africa. USA to the magazine. First of all, let me apologize to President uh, Perry Irma. When I first came in here, uh, you were wearing a uh, mask. So I did not recognize you. So, my apology. Okay. And I must commend you for what you're doing at the Sabu Museum. Ever since uh, uh, President Padre Buru stepped down, you have taken that big challenge and a very kind welcoming at the Sabu Museum. Thank you. And also, uh, Ms. Michelle Duster, I've known you for a while now through um, uh, Mary Swaps six, seven years ago with this project, Ida B. Wells. Uh, not too long ago, a good friend of mine, Nigerian artist, his name is uh, Abiola, drew the picture of Ida B. Wells mm -hmm. and presented it to uh, Miyolori Laifu. I mean, you should have seen. The, 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 the environment that day, I mean, it was very conducive, very, very nice. And I was looking for you there because I know you have been carrying this project for a long time. Now, fortunately, the, uh, the finally named the uh, Congress Parkway to uh, IWS. West. So, all credit to you. Uh, how satisfied are you now with this IWS West project? I just need to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there are actually several projects um, regarding Ida B. Wells that I was involved in, and um, I'll just kind of briefly tell you the sort of logic and the, the chronology. Um, I, I started working on the committee for the Ida B. Wells, what ultimately became the Ida B. Wells Monument in 2008. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to mention on this panel was the challenge that there, that we encountered, especially when it came to raising funds. Um, our experience working on the monument was that we, the committee, needed to come up with all the funding for the monument, and then once it was completed, it would be donated to the city of Chicago uh, as part of the city of Chicago's public arts uh, collection. So we did not get funding from the city. We had to raise the money privately. And I was actually surprised at how challenging it was to raise the money, which for me um, made me think about what this country values. Because especially what really hit me was when Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, in Wisconsin, a teenager, went and shot up people and was walking around freely and the police didn't bother him. And then $500,000 was raised to help him with his legal funds in like a week. And here we were, years of trying to raise money for a monument for a woman who, who fought for freedom, justice, and equality. And so it really made me, Michelle, think, what does this country value? that we are willing as a country, as a society, to raise a half a million dollars for a murderer. But it's a struggle to raise money for a woman who fought for freedom you know, uh, and um, democracy. So I, it just, that just really, I will always feel some kind of way about that. Um, and so you know, it took longer to raise the money than I ever imagined it would, considering who Ida B. Wells was and Richard Hunt. 
the combination of the two I thought would be a no-brainer um, as far as getting um, support. Now, the, the um, Ida B. Wells Drive was an interesting experience because we originally went to change Balboa. That was our original goal. And we got resistance from the Italian American community who wanted to continue to uh, celebrate Balboa. And so we ultimately ended up with, I think, something better, bigger. Um, so thank God they resisted. Um, so I'm very happy with Congress Parkway being changed to Ida B. Wells Drive. Um, and then there's some other situations that have happened around the country. I'll just mention one thing. Um, there was an initiative to have the journalism school at University of Mississippi, which is her home state, um, changed to, <clears throat> to be in her honor. And there was an enormous amount of resistance. So, you know, I personally have seen and experienced, um, you know, this, this, I, this sort of attitude of white men replacement syndrome. Um, you know, where if, if white men, uh, if, if black people or any people of color or women um, are, are it, there's an initiative to have representation, what I have seen, and I'm sure probably everybody up here has seen, is white men feeling like they're being replaced. And you can't even argue with the numbers because it's like we have over 700 monuments to Confederate soldiers, dead white men on horses, as I refer to them. And you try to have one, you know, statue or monument to a black woman, and it's like an outcry that the world is coming to an end. And that's what I've experienced. This attitude is very pervasive, and it's very challenging to sort of overcome and, and to even try to justify the, the need um, to, to be seen and to be represented um, without there being this a grievance, um, you know, that you're sort of countering. Yeah, and of course I can attest to that in terms of equity and funding. Uh, okay, uh, battle I find every single day in terms of trying to get equitable funding for the DuSable Museum of African American history, which is American history. <laughs> you can't separate the two, uh, right? But while some of our, you know, larger museums are sitting on an endowment of a billion dollars, billion with a B, dollars or more, that was put in the bank by taxpayers, largely, um, still there's this pushback for, for equity. But I think those are the, the, the that is the story. Right, and, and that's always the battle we're gonna be fighting. Uh, and that you know, brings me now to um, the story of a man who I think deserves a monument and a memorial, uh, and that is our recently dearly departed Timuel Black. Oh, yeah. And you know, Tim would have been 103 years old on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, and we lost him just you know, two days ago. Um, I can't think of a better person, Gerald, for you to create oh, yeah. uh, uh, a representational uh, uh, monument to than, than, than Tim Black and his lifetime uh, of fighting here in Chicago and really all over the country and even other parts of the world uh, for equality, for civil rights, um, for human rights, right? And my mom, who Ernie mentioned earlier, and some of you also know, is 90 years old. We went to visit Tim um, just about 10 days ago. So the like third, third, I think the third of October. Um, and even through his pain, the thing that he wanted to talk about nonstop was the struggle, yeah. and how the struggle continues, right? Um, and he said. You know, I've lived through, I'm going to try to get this verbatim, what he said to us 10 days ago. I've lived through so much and I've overcome so much in terms of racism and hatred. And I'm still here and I can tell you that we shall overcome. And we've got to keep on keeping on. And it's the young people, tell the young people 
the struggle continues, keep fighting because we shall overcome. And then he kind of, you know, rocked back and said, and I believe that it's going to be a better world. And we all have to believe that. And I think these debates and these struggles and these conversations and dialogues about, as Michelle said, what is important to America and Americans, what is important to us as human beings, um, that dialogue and that disruption, if you will, is what's going to get us to a better world. Of course. I want to just wait, say one thing in terms of the struggle for financing for these different things. Um, one of the monuments I'm working on is one of uh, Mahalia Jackson, because my business is in Chatham. She's, she's from Chatham, exactly. Um, a lot of people don't know she was a big civil rights advocate. And we have a proposal with DKs and with the Monuments Project to do a Mahalia Jackson. We actually had a couple of Zoom meetings. And the one thing that came up in the Zoom meeting was, but well, we don't have the budget. We don't have the budget for it. You know, if you guys can raise the money, almost your story verbatim. And um, I felt insulted that they would say, we don't have the budget, especially when so much money has been given and put aside uh, after this COVID thing and what's going on right now. It's, yeah, yeah, Bear Stadium, uh, Millennium Park, Magadini Park, there's always money to be had and be and public money. Yeah. But when it comes to uh, monuments and remembrances and adding those narratives and stories, that can change the story. There's always, you know, this this idea of okay, well, you know, you funded yourself. Uh, it that has to change. Yeah. yeah. And not essential. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to interject that little story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I just think that you know these discussions need to happen more often yes. and, and and with bigger audiences on a regular basis because. Uh, that's that's the only way to, to, to continue to uh, raise the voices and, and educate the young people and to you know, uh, uh, continue to get funding uh, for, for things like Mahalia Jackson. Uh, I am talking to Nidra, by the way, about that. So. Pat, thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you, Pigment. Thank you to all our wonderful guests uh, and our sponsors, absolutely, and this beautiful push um, uh, So thank you so much, everyone, for being with us tonight.